All right, so welcome to topic six of uh, Civic Education's Brainworks Education uh, lecture videos. And I think we're on track, we're doing what, uh, quite well. And I could actually encourage you that make sure you watch all these videos, make sure you have a solid grasp of all the 12 topics that we're going to do before we actually start focusing more on past paper questions. So we started our journey of um, civic education in terms of what governance is. Then we went on to talk about citizenship and human rights. And now we are now going to talk about, remember we've been isolating the, the citizens and the individual and we're trying to characterize the social and economic uh, status and activities of those citizens. And in particular today, we're going to focus on something that's innate among all human beings, which is the ability to want to be accepted, to be acknowledged and not isolated as an individual to find that group of people that actually accepts, accepts your way of life, your views and your opinions, the ability to want to be valued. So that's uh, about today's topic. So social sciences and demographic factors have made it possible for everyone to find their own people, their own culture. So that's the core of today's topic. It's actually just on culture. So what, what is culture? So culture refers to the sum total of the given society's way of life. So a sum total. So uh, a way of life is it's a whole. It's, it's made up of individual subfractions. It includes all aspects of people's way of life. And when we say people's way of life, we're talking about people who want to find acceptance in their beliefs. So culture is very diverse. And with the coming of the digital age, we even have things like meme culture. We have cancel culture. We have politically correctness uh, culture. So culture is becoming very... Uh, sensitive as we move uh, further into this digital age. So the following aspects included in culture, we have got um, taboos, where uh, even uh, things like uh, initiation ceremonies and certain individuals who have tattoos or maybe certain fetishes can be considered taboos, but that's part of uh, a society's culture. Festivals, including our own traditional uh, ceremonies. Uh, culture is also about the mindset. Just because someone is, uh, just because someone does not have dreadlocks, doesn't mean they can't believe in a Rastafarian uh, be, uh, belief and hold those Rastafarian values. So it's not all about uh, individual appearance, but it's also about values, beliefs, traditions, food, clothes, types of houses, technology, food, uh, dance, symbols, meanings, ideals of beauty, which is aesthetic movements, economic activities, education system, uh, spiritual beliefs, intellectual and emotional aspects, of the human being. So it's a very broad uh, definition. Culture is not something that one is born with, but something that is learned. So there's this argument of, is it nature? This is nature debate. So is it genetic? Do people have a genetic predisposition to belong to a certain value set beliefs or is it someone's upbringing and the way they interact with their environment that have made them prone to accept and accommodate a certain 
facets or a certain value or belief system. So it's that nature versus a nature debate. So components of culture. So a component is, you know, a unit or a part of something. I told you, it's, it's think of it as a whole, a whole made up of individual fractions. It is an element of the whole. These guys are still in my explanations. For example, uh, okay, we do not need this. So there are eight major uh, components of culture because I've explained what components are. So language. This is the most, you know, uh, certain people, even uh, we can say scientific jargon, political jargon, or even a vocabulary that's involved with uh, law firms. Language plays a very important identification feature. So maybe these can also be uh, components, or we can also maybe even call them characteristics. So language, number one, language among the eight components. This is the most obvious difference uh, between cultures. Language defines a cultural group, even through the same language, even though the same language can be used in different countries. It includes unspoken languages such as gestures, which mean different things in different cultures. For example, forming a circle with a thumb, and forefinger is a friendly gesture in the US, but it is a rude uh, sexual invitation gesture uh, in Zambia, Greece, uh, Turkey, among other places. So language is also part of culture. And when we talk about language, we're talking about communication and communication can be verbal or non-verbal, no wonder they gave an example of uh, the thumb finger uh, gesture, religion, need I say more? Religion is a major cultural component and religious taboos, customs, holidays, rituals dictate the behavior of a given society. So if you're Catholic, if you're Muslim, if you're Hindu, you're going to have your own belief system. That's also part of culture that's going to be able to identify you as part of the whole. It can be a major factor in a society because it can even dictate the type of food uh, that one eats. For example, my friend who's Hindu, she doesn't eat meat, so her diet is mostly vegetarian. The types of foods people eat, for example, oh, these guys are really still in my explanation. Hindus do not eat beef and devoted Roman Catholics do not eat uh, meat on Good Fridays while devoted Muslims do not drink uh, alcohol or certain uh, religious values. So values and attitudes, values and attitudes. So religion, uh, we, we spoke about religion, we spoke about language. So now we're talking about values, and attitudes, components of culture. This, this shouldn't be a hard topic for you to, to grasp, for you to understand. So values and attitudes, these are society's belief systems. They are so uh, these are society's belief systems, of course, they are the society's heart and are not easily changed. You know, it's very, it actually takes quite a long time for someone to change uh, someone's values or attitudes because human beings, once you have a routine, it's very hard to break off from that routine. It's hard to change behavior. So these things are very hard to change. If they change, they take a very slow process. Society's value system guides its attitudes to what is considered right and wrong. Most value systems are bared on society's central uh, religion. So values, if Zambia, let's say, is a Christian nation, you find that maybe 
uh, a good 80% of the people will have uh, will be leaning towards Christian uh, values and attitudes. Education. It is an important part of culture since culture is actually learned behavior. And I might as well argue and also say culture can actually be said to be conditioned behavior. There are three types of uh, learning that take place in a society. Informal learning, in which the child learns by imitating the behavior of the family members. That's our first stage of sociology. Uh, friends or homes where there is television from the character shown in films, uh, formal learning, and there's also formal learning uh, where adults and older siblings teach a young family member on how to behave in certain uh, situations. Then we also have technical learning in which teachers instruct a child in an education uh, environment about what, how, and why something uh, should be done. So we can actually say this educational culture is what drives to bring forth valuable citizens, functional citizens into the society. So another component of, uh, of uh, culture is a social organi uh, organizations. This is a way the society organizes itself. It relates uh, society to how it defines relationships, social in uh, institutions, such as marriage and status systems, such as the role of women and the children. So these social organizations may be uh, somewhat outdated in their beliefs, but they are still uh, part and hold a huge influence on society's culture. The extended family system is a common social institution in African societies, for it provides mutual protection and social support on a daily basis. This is now the big thing here. So technology and material culture. If you even go deeper into philosophy, um, one of them is actually a topic on its own. It's called materialism. So technology and material culture, these refer to a society's ability to create, design, and use things, create, design, use things, innovation, entrepreneurship, profit making. Terms like the industrial, uh, industrialized nations and developing nations like Zambia refer to different technologies and cultures. Thus, we speak of being in the Stone Age when the society used stones and Iron Age when our tools were used. Then we moved to the Industrial Age and now we are in a digital world, uh, the digital age. So law and politics, we can't run away from um, rules and regulations in any culture because without the, the law and politics, the whole idea of culture itself would disintegrate. So these are rules and structure that regulate the behavior of a society. The legal rules attract punishment, remember? So they, they needs to be that accountability uh, when they are not followed. The laws protect members of society to live in peace, free from fear and in human treatment. So aspect number seven is what actually holds uh, culture together. It's what sort of puts the limitations, the minimum um, restrictions and the maximum restrictions that are within moral um, limitations. 
So it uh, laws and politics sort of put a break on cultural extremes. Because remember, for every culture, you're going to have extremists, religious extremists, Muslim extremists, suicide bombers, fanatics. Every culture has its own extremists that have to be put on hold. You need breaks, you need laws, politics, and regulations to actually say you are actually going way too far. So aesthetics, aesthetics is also another branch of philosophy that actually focuses on beauty, on the perceptions of how society uh, judges art and uh, beauty. So aesthetics, this is society's perception of what is considered beautiful in art and in persons. So aesthetics, even let's say you're in the kitchen and you've prepared this lovely looking dinner and you've arranged it, you want your food to be presentable by the human eye because we all have this uh, facet of our mind that wants things to be visually appealing because visually appealing things are more culturally acceptable. So this forms another branch of culture called aesthetics. Oh, that landscape is good. Let's take a picture of it because this picture will be aesthetically uh, appealing. And when I post it on various social media platforms, I'm going to get that you know, recognition. So every culture has its own way of judging aesthetics. What is considered beautiful in one culture may not be considered beautiful in other cultures. Other people may find that, oh, Rastafari uh, dressing attire is not considered as aesthetically pleasing. Or other people can be like, oh, the Muslim jihad attire is degrading and it's not aesthetically uh, pleasing. So make a mental note of that. What may not be considered beautiful in one culture may be seen as odd or offensive in other cultures. What is considered good taste in one culture may not be uh, considered the same in other cultures. Some types of dressing, such as miniskirts in towns, are not acceptable in village in villages. These are the sort of verbal standards that we see because the old traditional African culture was rather as opposed to this sort of um, new age white uh, culture. We had our own traditions and beliefs. So I see a lot of uh, girls who get harassed for wearing something that's seen as provocative in the streets, and I don't think that's right. But again, that's, that's my belief system. That's what forms this interesting topic on culture. So please, uh, diagrams like this can actually come in an essay type of uh, question. All right. Right, so we can continue. Sorry about that interruption. So examining this diagram, you have to know all these uh, components of culture and at least have the ability to explain one or two things about all these eight uh, components of culture. So those are some of the components of culture we can, which I can actually say are characteristics of culture. But of course we want to 
dive way deeper into the characteristics of culture. So components, now we talk about what makes each individual component identifiable, so characteristics of culture. So the following, some of the characteristics or special features of culture, as usual, because culture is actually an ever-changing entity. So this list is not, we cannot actually say this list is actually exhaustive, but it's subject to continued change. So culture is dynamic, it's not static. So dynamic means it's, it's guys, see what I mean by the, the continue getting my explanation, right? Culture is dynamic, I mean, it's not static, it changes. It is not constant, but it is evolving and changing, even though change in some cultures is hard to accept than in others. For example, the ability of women to drive in other um, Islamic states. Change in technology is easy to accept than change in value system of society, but sometimes even changes in technology can actually be harder to accept. For example, people think 5G internet can actually give certain people uh, cancer. So for it to, to change, it is changing, but that change is a gradual process. It actually takes uh, quite a considerable amount of time. So culture is dynamic, it's not static, it's ever changing. Culture is learned. It is passed from one generation to another. By that time, you know, culture was being passed on through things like oral tradition. But now with the digital age and internet culture and information culture and meme culture, culture is, you know, easily rapidly being taught from one generation to another. So culture is learned, not born. We are not born with uh, an ideal culture. We cannot say a child is born and we say this is a Muslim child, this is a Hindu child, this is a Christian child. We are not born with a certain culture, but we are taught that culture as we learn to comprehend the natural world around us. Culture is cumulative. New things in new generations can be discovered and added to the already existing culture. Like I said, even meme culture, fashion culture, owing to this cultural cumulative effect, most high school learners today are familiar with mathematical insights and solutions that the ancient Greeks such as Archimedes and uh, anyway, this is a little bit of an outdated, um, but we can actually say, you know, culture is cumulative. Culture is comprehensive. Culture, you know, is a sum total of society's way of life that it's, uh, thus it's uh, comprehensive. So it's not something that can be, let's say, isolated within one component, but it's uh, subject to a whole. So if you want to comprehend culture, you cannot study just one culture in isolation, but you have to take the sum of all different types of uh, subcultures to want to understand what culture really is. A culture is shared of society share uh, a set of ideals, values, and the standard behavior. And this set of ideals is what gives meaning to their lives and what bonds them together. You know, that feeling of familiarity that I told you about, that feeling of wanting to belong. So culture is shared. So culture is symbolic. Culture is based on symbols. In order to 
in order for culture to be transmitted successfully from one person to the next, there is a system of symbols uh, created that translates the ideas of culture to its members, like you know, the, the, the crucifix. Culture is integrated. In order to keep culture functioning, all its aspects must be integrated. For example, the language should be able to describe all the functions of the culture, the symbols, the, the types of dressing. So everything has to be integrated uh, for it to fully function. People are not aware of their culture until they come into contact with other cultures. You know, you don't really know how different you are until you see until you have that culture shock, that cultural uh, exposure. People do not know all their culture. So you have to know a certain history because most cultures span more than 100 years, 1,000 years. So you might not know everything about uh, your individual culture. So people do not know all their culture. No one knows everything about their culture. In societies, there is specialized knowledge that is gender specific, either men or women, or, or women. Mm, no, this example doesn't make sense. We can move on. So if, if something in your notes doesn't really align, just stick to the explanations that I'm giving you. So culture gives a society a range of permissible behavioral patterns. So culture can actually make people belonging to that culture have a behavioral pattern that's sort of predictable. And you can say, all right, people who are uh, Christians will behave in a certain way. People are Jehovah's Witnesses will behave in a certain way. So there is this permissible behavioral uh, pattern. Cultures commonly allow a range of ways in which men and women can be men and women. Culture tells us uh, how a husband or a wife is to behave in a marriage. However, these rules of permissible behavior are usually flexible and don't agree with this. Because remember, it's very hard to change culture when we talk about our values and beliefs. As you know, technology can be easily changed, but when we talk about culture and beliefs, it's not really easy to change our culture in that way. So I don't agree on the flexibility part of this sentence, but we can actually say culture gives a society a range of our permissible our behavioral patterns. Cultures no longer exist in isolation. Remember the world is, we exist in a metropolitan sort of environment. So there is no society that can exist in complete isolation unless you are one of those ancient, ancient tribes that have been protected by the state saying, leave these people. They are the oldest living tribe that we have. So please leave them in isolation and let them practice their individual culture, but the world is big, it's metropolitan. It's metropolitan. So there is no culture that exists in isolation. There is, we exist in a huge cultural shock change now. And that's the beauty of the modern world, if you were to ask me. So languages and indigen, uh, indigenous patterns are being replaced uh, rapidly. Some languages are actually now evolving. And many societies are getting cultural traits from economically dom uh, dominant societies of the world. North America and Western Europe, for example. Well, these societies also adopt words, foods, and other cultural traits from all over the world. So like, this is what I said. You see your children uh, 
reading comic books or watching anime. That's another form of uh, cultural adoption from Japanese culture and American and European culture. So we talk about culture, what it is. So what is the importance of culture? So importance of culture. The fact that culture is part of us, it is important to study it for the following reasons. Number one, it reinforces one's identity and ability to critically reflect on that identity. It makes you feel like you are part of something, like, you know, this is my identity, so I'm going to defend my culture or hold my culture with that form of pride. This allows one to develop and interact with others, thus bringing mutual understanding between different societies and people. It's important for the identity of a society. The Lozi people are identified as the Lozi people because they have their own uh, culture. Since culture includes language, music, dances, festivals, rituals, and traditional craftsmanship, cultural heritage brings identity of the society. Learning about culture brings development. So if you may, you know there's that culture exchange where you learn from each other and integrate the best aspects like oh there's one way of doing this there's one way of building this so that cultural exchange actually brings about a development according to the universal declaration of human rights article 27 affirms every human being to, to freely participate in the culture of one of life of one's country. So culture is also a human right. Everyone, everywhere, the impact of culture on individuals and the community uh, development are being measured, studied, and rediscovered. So this falls in the realm of uh, research. It's called qualitative research, where you're actually studying uh, belief systems, attitudes, value systems of a given society, so qualitative research. There is keen interest in the relationship between arts and culture and the economic and social development of our communities. So types of culture. Like I said, we have certain new things like cancel culture, meme culture. So this list is non-exhaustive. So mass culture, 10 types of culture, it's quite a lot, mass culture. This culture is produced from, you know, machines and consumed in large scale. For example, record industry, television industry. This mass culture is actually a million dollar industry. It is also spread through electronic media and other types of high technology like I previously said. Popular culture, also called pop culture. This is a product of changing needs and innovations in people's lives. It is uh, short-lived. This culture is being seen among youths who have new music, fashion, among others. When someone says, oh my goodness, this is so uh, 2020, that's pop culture for you. Uh, folk culture, also called folklore also known as residual culture, culture of the past. This past is revived from elements of the forgotten past due to nostalgic feels. So if someone has nostalgia, you are remembering a past event. Like if you want that nostalgia vibe, let's say um, you've sort of grown up and matured to eat jiggies because jiggies are the thing of the, of the past. And then 
in your adult years, you decide to actually, you know, maybe you are babysitting, you decide to maybe have a few jiggies, and that brings you some form of nostalgia or memories of the past, that feeling, that's, what, that's what's called that nostalgia. So nostalgia is what keeps our folklore culture alive. Uh, synthetic culture. This is also called artificial culture, which has mainly destroyed the cultural identities of developing countries like Zambia, who adopt Western ideologies. Uh, this is what I've been saying, that it's not necessarily a good thing for Zambia to adopt uh, Western ideologies. I, I feel like you are not subject to believe everything, but uh, integrate and improve. Don't just integrate and accept. Indigenous culture has been only preserved as a tourist attraction to end foreign currency, uh, even in heritage sites and national uh, museum museums. Ideal couch. So refers to some kind of aspiration of where a group of people would uh, wish to be. So the ideal, for example, every society views itself in a positive way and has the highest uh, virtues and standards that it aspires to be. Real couch. It refers to the actual behavior of people in a society. So what's actually on the ground versus what's being heard of or what's being seen of on TV. So it's actually best to experience real culture in real time. Uh, when you are around that cultural belief system. So there are certain subcultures. So actually other cultures deviate and become cultures of their own. So these are actually called subcultures. So this is a way of life or behavior, which a small group of individuals belonging to the same culture may portray. Subculture uh, may arise due to different occupations in society, which result in variations in power and as well as prestige. So counterculture, you know, certain cultures evolve because of lack of tolerance towards other cultures. So this refers to the behavioral patterns and lifestyles shown by a group of people that are obsessed to the uh, that are opposed to generally accept standards of behavior in society in the society. So a group of street kids and unemployed youths who have their own way of talking, leisure, behavior, and that are different from other cultures. So there's this uh, counter culture. Hip hop culture was actually a counter culture that evolved to sort of fight against the system, even rock uh, culture I can actually say that. So there is a cultural heterogeneity differences. So this refers to a society that contains a variety of groups of different races, beliefs, religions, as well as nationalities. Then cultural homogeneity, so something that's the same. So this is common culture of people, similar race, beliefs, religion, and nationality. So Zambia's society core values. Again, when we actually isolate this towards Zambia, we are not saying that these uh, core values are not actually subject to change because we did mention that culture is something that's changing and evolving, it's dynamic, it's not static, so even Zambia. So core means essential or very important, while value means the quality of being useful. So therefore, core values are shared values which are practiced in all societies in the world. So these are Zambia's core values, 
obedience to authority, tolerance to people's views, mutual respect, respect for privacy, peaceful resolutions of conflict, freedom of expression. So a whole list of our Zambian core values, which may be practiced, which may not be practiced, some may be neglected. So cultural practices in Zambia, Zambia has various ethnic groups. So the ethnic groups in Zambia share a few uh, common characteristics such as respect for elders. Uh, we have an extended family systems, a right of passages where, you know, we have a certain belief system where, you know, you are born, you get married, you die, um, etc. Traditional ceremonies like uh, the Komboka ceremony that just ended. Many traditional festivals are held to commemorate past events. Others function uh, of other functions of uh, traditional ceremonies include expressing, reflecting, reinforcing cultural relationships and values. But nowadays they are not mostly used for for this. They are just mostly used for tourism. So types of traditional ceremonies, you can have harvest uh, festivals, commemorative uh, ceremonies, which focus on activities that honor the memory of the dead, you know, harvest festivals. You can also have religious festivals for the gods in honor of uh, specific uh, spirits or gods. Uh, ceremonies which move with uh, rhythms of nature or rhymes of nature, such as the new moon, uh, flooding cycles, such as the Kumboka. So ceremonies uh, for small intimate groups, these are like the initiation ceremonies and also, you know, public uh, ceremonies. And this just gives a list of some of the ceremonies that are practiced in Zambia. You should actually know some of these ceremonies, but this actually, this actually moves away slightly from civic education and enters sort of the history aspect uh, of Zambia, history and geography. So these types of tra traditional ceremonies, you know, they have got various uh, traditional attires. They have various arts. And some of them can be abstract uh, arts, uh, even uh, some form of songs, and also hospitality. So traditionally, Zambians are friendly people. In a traditional system, uh, in a traditional setting, so we have this, uh, you know, sort of a uh, spirit of humanity, which is actually adopted from a South African saying, which is actually called the spirit of Ubuntu. So that's the main focus of today's topic on culture. The next topic that we're going to do will be now going into the biological system of a human being. And we're going to talk about drugs and drug abuse. The people who abuse drugs have fought. some of the types of uh, drugs, uh, drug abuse, and the types of drugs that people abuse. You know, adulting is not easy. It's not necessarily easy. No wonder most adults can actually be prone to alcohol abuse disorder. So we're going to discuss certain elements and certain components of. Um, substance abuse in our next civic education lecture. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for listening, please study hard.